Our next speaker is Erkin Alp. He is a senior scientist at Argonne National Laboratory with the Advanced Photon Source. He is a, a leader in the field of using synchrotron light sources for investigations. Uh, there are lots of uh, these facilities now in many places around the world. Uh, but also, the light sources are very much an international endeavor as well. Good morning. Thank you, Bill, for the introduction. And I want to thank Amy for getting me into this kind of troubles. Uh, <laughs> I'm not as eloquent or as skillful as, as Amy are with words, but I will do my best. Uh, and I'm gonna give you the view from the bottom, actually, how it looks from the, from the eye of a scientist who is, who is involved in this. So I'm from Argonne National Laboratory, which hosts this beautiful facility called Advanced Photon Source. I was involved with the construction of it as well as in its operation in the last 20 years. Um, when we talk about science and diplomacy, I think one thing we have to understand is that you have to have established leadership in, in one field in order to be effective. And the United States certainly has accomplished that over the last 200 years, I would say, uh, a, a scientific leadership. In my field, I can look at some of the early successes of, of this uh, effort, and I can point out, for example, the first Van de Graaff generator at Princeton in 1929, here is Van de Graaff himself, actually. First cyclotron at Berkeley by Lawrence. Uh, first uh, synchrotron light in General Electric. These are the gentlemen who were involved in this uh, glass uh, accelerator, which is emitting light. Um, first user base, uh, first dedicated storage ring, actually, in Wisconsin, 1968, this machine here. And the first user base large scale storage ring for general users, National Synchrotron Light Source. So existence of these kind of leadership activities actually position you in the world to actually accomplish something that you can, you can be credible. So these sources uh, that I will talk about, uh, how many of you have actually been to a synchrotron or? Okay, so that's fair. Uh, these sources uh, are ubiquitous, they are everywhere. The one that is in the United States at the moment that is the largest is the Advanced Photon Source, which takes place at, in the Argonne National Laboratory just outside of Chicago. Um, Europeans were two years ahead of us, and they built this fantastic facility called European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, which is taking place, uh, which, which is hosted uh, at the site of ILL in Grenoble. Um, Germans have had similar effort to, to almost more than 50 years now, and their most recent invention is uh, Petra 3, which occupies about, uh, about one fourth now of this uh, ring. And the uh, Japanese followed immediately by uh, about two years behind these facilities uh, in, in, in Spring 8 in Hyogo. So one thing, uh, since these facilities come online more or less at the same time, there was early on competition, all right? Uh, scientists showing their, their uh, instruments to be better than, than their counterparts. And I clearly remember having a one-to-one -one meeting with a very experienced Danish scientist, uh, Jens Alts Nielsen, and I used the word competition and our competitors. And it was a one-to-one -one meeting in a small room, and he put his hand on my, on my hand and said, my young friend, let me give you one advice. And science competition is not like sports competition. There can be two winners in a science competition. And, and therefore, choose your competitors in a field that you can benefit from their competition. So that left a big impression on me. And indeed, our management was very clever. So they started this tri-party meetings between Argonne, Grenoble, and, and Spring 8. And later on, in the last few years, Petra has joined. So these meetings rotate. And they actually take scientists and engineers from their home institutions to these meetings where we learn not only appreciate their accomplishments, but we learn where they are. And then we avoided the words of like, oh, my instrument works better than yours. And it really helped build up communities, exchange users between different facilities, and transfer know-how and technology from one facility to another. In almost every aspect of it, it's not just only science, but the computer controls, engineering accomplishments. There are so many other aspects, user programs, development of the user programs. It really helps to have mutual understanding and frequent interaction between these big facilities. 
Um, if you go into one of these facilities, you will find actually almost the same thing. There are quadrupole magnets, dipole magnets, octopole magnets to keep the electron beam in orbit. And then the, every now and then you will find these wonderful machines called undulators, which are basically a set of magnets that undulate the electron beam, which then causes a laser-like radiation to come out. All right? And this X-ray beam is the one that actually revolutionized the protein crystallography. For example, we saw last night this wonderful award ceremony with the two Polish scientists have accomplished most of their work at the synchrotrons. A number of Nobel Prizes in the last few years have come out of, out of these facilities. So if you look inside, this is, this is the one I work. The reason I chose this slide is not to impress you that we have so many facilities, but actually to impress upon you that these are multidisciplinary tools. These are not tools of physics, but these are tools of material science, biological and life sciences, geological and soil sciences, environmental sciences, chemistry, physics, polymers. What we didn't list here are like cultural heritage. There are so many aspects of, of science that these facilities touch. And you see many of the facilities have multicolors, which means there are multiple programs. And most impressive, of, of course, are these biology-oriented programs. We are the largest depositor of the protein data bank in the world at the moment. So we solve hundreds of structures every year and measure more than a million crystals, actually, in, at the synchrotron facilities. So in addition to these big international facilities, uh, there are also countries that actually decided to build their own facilities in, in spite of the existence of ESRF, for example, in, in, in Grenoble. Um, diamond light source outside of Oxford, mostly motivated by protein crystallography. Uh, Soleil, which is in the old location at Orsay, uh, where spectroscopy flourishes quite a bit. Uh, Electra, this is a facility led by Carlo Rubia after he left uh, CERN. And now they have this fantastic uh, linear accelerator to produce laser-like source called free electron laser. And uh, Swiss light source, which is over here, but is now building uh, also a accelerator for free electron laser across. Um, Canadians have built one. I have worked in their uh, organization for about 10 years as an as a international advisor. Um, they have a very thriving program. Uh, Berkeley, of course, the birthplace of the, of the cyclotrons and, and, and synchrotrons, has a nice facility called Advanced Light Source. Uh, probably they have the best view because Golden Gate Bridge is right across, right? Um, BESI, which was the successor of uh, Sesame, I will touch upon that in a in, in, in few minutes. This is in the new campus in the East Berlin called Adlershof. I don't know if you have ever been there. It's the largest science city in the world, actually, Adlershof. We have ten, more than 10,000 scientists in one campus working on almost all aspects of energy and environment. Um, Australians built their own. A new addition to Brookhaven and SLS2, a perfect example of small countries doing very big work this is MAX4. This is the brightest synchrotron in the world at the moment. It will start working next year, which led to a new design uh, called multiband acromat lattice, which is now copied by almost all these big four facilities. Now they are upgrading their own, uh, their own facilities. And this is due to the longevity of the accelerator programs in Lund, as well as uh, the spectroscopy program at Lund. Um, Pohang Light Source in Korea. Uh, and, and ALBA in Barcelona. And it goes on. I mean, it's really a lot. Taiwan has built now the second one. This was the first synchrotron source in Taiwan. This is now the second one, which is a high brightness source. Shanghai has a fantastic new facility. And now they are planning to build a free electron laser next to it. Cornell underground. This is where I did most of my early experiments. A fantastic facility. Now they are trying to build an energy recovery LINAC. Uh, Stanford is the birthplace of many, many ideas. Uh, uh, Herman Winnick uh, has suffered through these machines for all of his life, leading it. And uh, now is the home of the linear coherent light source, the most brightest synchrotron, uh, synchrotron light in the world. So if you look at it, these, there are a lot of investment in, in this field, and there's a lot of excitement in this field. And I wanted to share that with you. 
Now, if you look where these facilities are, they are, of course, the usual suspects, North America, Europe, and Japan. And now China is coming into play. China has been decided to launch a new high-energy photon source, the brightest source in the world uh, by, by 2020, uh, just outside of Beijing. It's called high-energy photon source. All right. um, Brazil has decided to follow the example of Lund, and now they have launched a program called Sirius, which is going to be, again, a very bright X-ray source in the, in the southern hemisphere. And uh, now Herman is pushing for a possible source in, 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 in uh, Africa. As you see, there's nothing there, which is really a shame. So I really applaud uh, Herman's energy and, and enthusiasm to push a light source in Africa. Of course, there is this sesame that, that uh, Amy alluded to, and I would like to say a few words about that. So these sources produce about 50,000 users. People come and use them. They produce over 20,000 papers per year, and over 10,000 scientific and technological jobs are generated. I can count so many statistics, superior statistics about synchrotrons, but you get the idea that these are massive international facilities. So what is common to all these, photo, all these sources? Well, of course, they all have students, scientists, engineers, and administrators. They have something called proposal evaluation teams. You might be wondering, how, how do you get access to these facilities? And they are based on scientific peer-reviewed proposal systems. So you can be sitting somewhere in Africa and send a proposal to APS, and you will get beam time without any cost, without paying anything. If the idea is good, we'll, we'll, we will honor it and we will get your team. So there's no cost in running these facilities and most, most of them are run on proposal evaluation system. So therefore, they have users from all over the world. Um, they have every year open users meeting. So anyone can go to the users meeting and, and look at what's going on and learn from, from their experiences. They have vendors. Actually, this is something overlooked. The people who build instruments are not necessarily the facilities themselves, but companies. And these companies, when they build something nice for you, they would like to build it for other people. So whether you like it or not, and sometimes we like it actually, what you have invested with the company is immediately translated into a copy machine or a more improved machine elsewhere. So I really admire their, their ability to, to diffuse the technology that, that is coming out of these facilities. And, and our pride, of course, is that our students and postdocs freely go from one place to another and carry information with them. And those are the biggest contributors to the success of these facilities. So out of this background came an idea in 1999, uh, 1997 actually. Herman and Gustav Voss at uh, DAISY uh, were confronted with the fact that BESI the Berlin electron synchrotron was going to be discarded and will become BSI-2, and they were thinking what to do with this. So I remember in 1999, Herman contacted me, and since I have roots in the Middle East, he suggested that I should take this machine to Turkey, where I'm from. And, and my efforts wasn't successful, but it led to many successful other things, so I wouldn't say that it was in vain. But uh, we ended up with this facility in Amman, and, and Flavia, in the previous session, uh, alluded to the fact that the roof was collapsed last year. Every 30 years, there is actually snow in Amman and Jerusalem, and it was one of those. But they have recovered. So the member countries are uh, at odds. You know, Turkey and Cyprus, they are not the best friends. Jordan and, um, I'm sorry, Israelis and Palestinians, um, Iranians and, and, and others. So, you know, there are, there are known uh, let's say, political differences between these countries, different priorities. But they were able to get together and sustain a long-term collaboration. So this is BC1 in 1999. And uh, they decided to make this a museum. Did it ever become a museum, science museum, actually, Herman? I don't, I don't know. know. But that was the plan, that they were going to convert this into a science museum and build a new one. So with the help from UNESCO, we raised about more than half a million dollars from UNESCO, which we then gave it to physicists in Yerevan in collaboration with the Germans, right, to package sesame, uh, package Bessie rings in such a fashion that we can unpack it and use it 
years later, maybe a decade later. So it went on to a ship in Hamburg in 2002, I think. You took this picture or was? No, still Probably, still. yeah. And uh, six years later, it appeared in this form in Amman. And it's a beautiful facility. This was when it was just built. And now the booster synchrotron of Bessie is working. And it produced the first light, actually, last year. This is the synchrotron light coming out of the booster synchrotron at uh, about 1 GeV, uh, uh, which is an amazing uh, feat. So when people say Sesame will start working next year, I say no, Sesame has started working as a scientific facility 10 years ago. It's producing papers. Some of our uh, students and, and technical staff has been recruited to many places around the world. So if you go there, it is a working facility with publications, with regular meetings, with their advisory boards. So it is a, a fantastic scientific place as we speak. So uh, there are many, many people come and visit Sesame. I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the technical advisory committee. So we meet every year in Amman. And when it is finished, it will have uh, these beam lines. This is, the, this is the storage ring, and this is the booster that I just showed you, and here's the microtron from Bessie that injects the electrons. So this is right now the highest electron facility in the Middle East, anywhere in the Middle East. And uh, I, will, I, will, I, will over, I will skip this slide, which gives you technical details about Sesame. If you are interested, I will be happy to share it with you. But who are the players, and where is the diplomacy actually that comes in? Sesame has a council which is made up of members from people from the member countries as, as well as from the observer countries. They have a scientific advisory board. They have a machine advisory board, which I'm part of. I, I was the co-chair with Herman Winnick of the first scientific advisory board for uh, almost five years. Um, UNESCO, which is actually the, the main reason why Sesame survived. And let me tell you why. When I get involved with Sesame, uh, my wife asked me, why are you going there? And I tried to explain. And then only when I used the word UNESCO, she said, oh, I understand. <laughs> All right? So it has some, some institutions have this magic. And UNESCO has this respect that people can recognize. When you say this is under the auspices of UNESCO, people pay attention to. And without that, it would not have taken place. I'm, I'm pretty convinced of that. International Atomic Energy Agency is a big support, definitely. Which, which provides training uh, uh, support. Country organizations. So each country has a, a corresponding organization with UNESCO, uh, with uh, Sesame. For example, in the case of Turkey, that is Turkish Atomic Energy Agency Authority. So they are the ones that actually channel the money from the Turkish budget into Sesame. And I think it's the same in Jordan. It's the Atomic Energy Agency. So every country has one organization uh, that actually facilitates. So if you are not in if you're not familiar with the bureaucrats running that organization, you're not going to get your uh, yearly money. It's, it's very critical. So national funding agencies, atomic energy agencies, the uni universities, they have to support these ministries. And uh, how, do you, how do you actually put all this together? So Herman, when he gave me the job to, to help him with the, with the scientific organization, there were actually no grassroots efforts in the Middle East at that time that we could get our hands on. NSF was trying something on the Material Science Network, but it was not very successful. So we had to start from scratch. And as along the way, we learned that by, by training the young people early, we created the critical step to generate the support from these other organizations. Um, do I have a few more minutes? Or yeah. So let me give you one example. Uh, about four years ago, Sesame was in dire straits because the funds from European Union didn't come, funds from United States didn't come, and we had no money to buy the synchrotron. So a brilliant idea came from the Israeli side, which said, if four other countries will match, Israel is willing to donate in the range of about a million dollars a year for five years in a row. And uh, so Herman asked me, can you, can you actually help that Turkey should get this first? So I went to Turkey, I went to the Atomic Energy Agency head, and I said, we need this. And he said, why would Turkey pay an extra money? We are already paying our membership. Why should we pay extra money? I said, why don't you ask the university presidents whether they will support this initiative? And he's, he immediately saw 
that the answers will be no, so that he didn't have to do anything. So he said, great, I will, I will do that. So he decided to send a letter to presidents. And I called Herman, and I said, could you please provide me all the trainees that we supported from Turkey? And I got the names. I found where they are. And with the help with our science chairman, Zehra Sayers, we wrote letters to these people. And we said, please, go to your university's president's office. There is a letter from Atomic Energy Agency which says whether sesame is good for you or not. And make sure that you say yes. <laughs> right? We even wrote a small template letter to help them to facilitate this. So after a few months, I go back to Atomic Energy Agency, and, and I have an appointment to see him. And he says, I can't believe it. There are 27 positive letters from the presidents of the university. I never expected that. Now, this is, of course, is only possible because we were able to bring these people to Europe, to United States, to Japan, train them, and then go back. And they now know they become their support, your supporters. So it is critical that you establish these networks early on. Uh, for those of you which, which beam lines will be built, you know, we will have protein crystallography, fluorescence spectroscopy, infrared, powder diffraction, small angle scattering, ultraviolet, soft X-ray violet. So if you're, a, if you're a chemist, physicist, biologist, soil scientist, you can thrive at sesame. There is no doubt about that. Uh, sesame is made up of officially of a council, and the council has always very respected the leaders. Our first chairman was Herwig Schopper, the director of CERN. Our current chairman is Chris Llewellyn Smith, who's also ex-director of CERN. And uh, that creates an, an atmosphere, an aura. CERN, like UNESCO, is a very recognized name. So it's important to establish credibility early on. They have, as I mentioned, beamline advisory committees, scientific advisory committee, technical advisory committee, which I'm a member, and training advisory committee. And these committees actually, by and large, work very well. They meet every year. They, they have an agenda. They push their agenda. And uh, so in one of the council meetings, actually, uh, they recognized when Gustav Adolfos passed away, uh, there was a, a, a memorial for him. And I think I saw uh, Amy here, right? And Zafra here, right? And her, I don't know if Herman is here or not. I haven't seen him. I was in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> so Sesame Diplomacy. A scientific facility somewhere in the Middle East at the time of trouble was intriguing, but it was a very attractive idea. So UNESCO auspices was very critical for credibility and diplomatic gambit in the early period. Early scientific workshops played a critical role in establishing beachheads. Strong emphasis on training young people was the correct strategy. We had to have that, otherwise we would not succeed. And international scrutiny of science and the machine choices led to an attractive design. We didn't just simply say, oh, we'll take Bessie and we'll put it in. Despite the financial difficulties, the guy who invented the multiband acromat lattice, Dieter Einfeld, was the first machine director of uh, Sesame. And he insisted that we should come up with a bright, this brighter design than old Sesame. Sesame, because one of the critical comments we always received was, well, this is an old machine. When it is finished, it will be outdated. So why do you want to do that? No. Actually, what we were building was quite a big modern machine. And that because of the international scrutiny of the scientific affairs and the technical affairs. Without such scrutiny, we would not get that. And the promotion of the idea of Sesame in various government offices in the, in, in the academia was very long and very difficult. So you go to universities and people say, why do you need this facility? I mean, we can go to Europe and use it. So you have to, you have to overcome all these, all these difficulties. So the view from the bottom is the following. From the scientist's point of view, you say, is scientific credibility more important? Is political importance more important? Is the feasibility that determines? Is the relevance to your own field? You can answer these. I think scientific credibility is very important. Political importance, I don't think scientists care too much about that. You know, we're not so much motivated by political things. Um, feasibility, yeah, to some degree, that's important. Relevance to own field, it helps, but it is not necessary, because scientists are actually a lot bigger than their own field. So I think that is a correct description. Well, then how do you establish the scientific credibility? I think only scientists involved can establish the scientific credibility. And you can challenge that. And I will challenge my, myself. And I say, yes, that's necessary, but it's not enough. 
All right? You have to have credible organizations <laughs> behind you. You can't just say, I'm, I'm a good scientist, and therefore that, that validity doesn't come just from there. Well established institutions, I mentioned, a determined country leadership. The reason Sesame went to Jordan is because the Jordanians wanted to have it. It wasn't something we imposed upon them, it was something they wanted to have it, and that's why we have it there. Credible scientists and leaders behind it, like Voss, Herman Winnick, Chopin, Llewellyn Smith, without those big names, we wouldn't be where we are today. And all three elements have to come together in order to, to succeed. So I think I will repeat myself if I, if I read this, but I'm going to say something about the one I wrote in red. Learning how to speak like a diplomat, all right? It's a must, but it is very easy. When I first went to the meeting in UNESCO, you know, you sit around this round, big round table with the microphones, and you have to press a button which brings a red light, which, which means I would like to say something, which means you have to wait a few hours before you are recognized by the chair, all right? So I thought it was crazy. This, this way, we're not going to go anywhere. You know, it, we are so accustomed to breaking up a sentence and say, but that's not correct. You can't say that. And you can also not engage on a lateral conversation. You can only address the chair and, and vice versa if you want to say something. So in the end, I realized after 10 years that it's actually quite an effective method. It's not, it, it seems slow, it seems sluggish, but it avoids the conflict and it avoids um, antagonizing people you, whose support you actually need. Right? So it is critical, and that's of course out of long experience that diplomats have, have evolved into that communication mode, but we as scientists, we have to learn, and it's not that easy. So the first SME meeting was held in, in 2000, and I noticed the other day I was looking at this, that uh, Dan Shetman was among the, among the invitees. And when he came to Ankara, I was very differential to him. I was very, you know, treating him very nicely. And somebody came and said, why are you so different to this guy? I said, well, you know, if anyone in this room has a chance someday to win a Nobel Prize, I think it will be da Danny Shetman. And he said, well, what did he discover? He said, quasi-crystals. Didn't, didn't mean anything to them, all right? But, but I knew even then that having people credible like Dan Shetman or Giorgio Margaritondo or Bob Batterman, you know, who is the, who is the father of Cornell X-ray source, actually, chess. And uh, uh, it was critical. You know, without those people, you couldn't actually accomplish what you wanted to do. And these days, our users' meetings are not uh, measured in, in tens or twenties, but it's actually in the hundreds. And people actually fight. People put pressure on us to get their students and their postdocs accepted into the users' meeting. It's really huge. And its impact went beyond Sesame. I mean, this was from 2013 light source meeting at, An at Ankara that I have organized. And you see there are more than 150 people. So the impact of Sesame went beyond the limits of Jordan. And it spurred interest in Iran, Iranian light source, as well as in uh, uh, Turkish Accelerator Center. And, uh, now we're learning about African light source, perhaps, which, which will be another legacy of Sesame. So here's the Turkish light source that we are envisioning. Here's the Turkish synchrotron, and then there's a free electron laser facility, maybe a part proton accelerator facility, and lots of research institutions around it. So this project is thriving mainly because I think Sesame induced these ideas over a long term in the Turkish government offices, and we were then able to get some traction to get money for these projects. <laughs> Two unresolved issues that I would like to mention. One is the US financial contribution. This is still pending. There are players in the State Department, in the US Congress, at UNESCO. And of course, there are the political realities of the Middle East. So we are hoping that we will get the United States contribution, financial contribution, although the United States was a critical player and is a critical player in Sesame contributing to all of the committees, contributing to the training. So we're not bystanders on Sesame, but we could do a little bit more, I think. And uh, transfer of funds from Iran to Sesame has become a difficult issue for the last few years. I think with that, I would like to say thank you.